Good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, second live session of the day. Actually, the first one was where I was hosted uh, by a central London property developer who wanted to know about a few questions he had about real estate, and that was good. Right now, all is well, Mayfair Consultants. Right now, I've got a live session with bd brock all the way from the us who is a uh, professional wrestler entrepreneur, and we're going to go live with him right now um it was supposed to start at three hey bro how are hey. you doing man good to see good. you good to see you too are you well yeah i'm doing well about as well as i can be how are you good stuff good uh, there was a confusion in the uh, timing that we had, but uh, apologies yeah, I for that. I apologize. I thought you were five hours ahead, not six, but uh, I forget I'm in central time zone. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. It's locked down right now, so everyone's like, uh, no one, no one uh, keeps a tab on their times. Um, right. So how's life in the U.S.? Where are you based in the U.S.? I'm in Houston, Texas, or about 35 minutes outside of the city of Houston. So, I was in I was in Houston about uh, 2015. Really? There was a there I'm was sure. a there was good. It was good. I mean, I was there for 14 days, and I only saw two people uh, cross the road. I mean, oh, yeah. the rest of them were all in cars. I've never yeah. seen. I mean, nor I uh, based in London. You see people walking, cycling, you know, on the on the move, on the road, and everything. But here it was like, wow, it's just American four by fours all the way. You know, it uh, was it was. Yeah, well, Americans are lazy, so that's half of it. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But yeah, uh, there's a lot of traffic in Houston for sure. Yeah, I mean, I sort of, I sort of noticed that on the freeways and everything that you have out there. It was pretty uh, jam-packed. So uh, what I wanted to start with is if you could introduce yourself, what you do, and then we can get the conversation going. Well, my name is Brock Baker. I do a lot of different things. Um, primarily, uh, I'm an entertainer, entrepreneur. I've been a pro wrestler for four, almost five years. Uh, I've done small level acting i'm still trying to dip my toes into that uh but yeah i i've I, i've had an entrepreneurial spirit my entire life i come from an entrepreneurial family okay uh, a year ago i started a, a company with my mom called bully it's a uh tex-mex food it's a okay. food service and uh lately i've been dipping my toes into production film production um, but with the coronavirus, I've kind of had to put a few things on hold. Well, I shouldn't say hold, but it's on idle. You know, I'm still it's, uh, it's sort of slow. It's moving yeah. slow. Yeah, I'm still progressing, but I'm not, you know, full steam ahead like I would like to be or I plan yeah. to be. Um, but as soon as we start coming back up, uh, I'm going to be on the attack. So that's a little bit about me. You can follow me. Good at stuff. Rockers. Absolutely. Um, just to take me through a bit of your journey, you mentioned that you've always had an entrepreneurial uh, background. And so how did you move from that background? And then how did wrestling happen? And and actually, you've got uh, Brock as your first name. And then, you know, when you think of Brock, all you think about Brock Lesnar. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we're not comparable in terms of size, I will tell you that. <laughs> uh, that is a scary... Like, okay, so if we had to send anyone uh, from planet Earth to fight the aliens, like let's just say an alien, uh, their best alien, I would send Brock Lesnar. <laughs> uh, we're not comparable in terms of size at all, but uh, yeah, I get that a lot, Brock uh, and Brock is my real name. It's not a stage yeah. name. Real name. Um, so, I mean, as we were talking, entrepreneurial background. And, I mean, if you can just take me through that. And then right. why did you choose wrestling? Well, so, 
long story short, when I was four years old, I became absolutely obsessed with pro wrestling. Um, and that obsession, you know, it's it's waned a little bit as I've gotten older. It's more, you know, I look at it as a business now and not as a fan at all. Um, there's times where I'll, I'll enjoy a match or I'll enjoy a show as a fan. But once you're into it, you're integrated, you kind of look at it more from, you know, the business standpoint. Um, but pro wrestling, really, when you're a pro wrestler – or I would say even an athlete, you kind of are an entrepreneur because you are your own business, essentially. Um, is that how is that how the wrestling foundations hire a person? So it's 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 like uh, they don't hire them, but they sort of contractual. Is there a contractual <laughs> business, something like that? Oh, sorry. One of my one of my dumbass friends in the comments. Uh, it's all right. No worry actually a couple months ago and kicked some ass over there but anyway bringing it back to your question um yep. so yeah you're an independent contractor essentially in pro okay wrestling. and that's um, with um because i've always seen wwe you know i mean uh since when it was wwf you know the hulk hogan days the ultimate warrior days uh right. what's the other guys the macho man you know all that kind of stuff you know yeah. i've been watching i've been watching uh that kind of wrestling and then Slowly, gradually, the interest sort of faded out. I mean, the last person I possibly remember, um, I saw it when it was John Zena and Brock Lesnar, and after that, the 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 sort of interest just faded out. You know, it was it was getting like sort of growing up as well, and you understood that. Come on, you know, it's not, it's all it's all bloody planned the way it goes, and 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 they're just acting on stage kind of thing. You right. know? Well, I mean, in regards to that, like, the way I look at it, and this is something I've learned being around, like, entertainment over the last four or five years, is even when something is, quote, unquote, reality television, you could assume it's 50% fake. It's staged. Fake. Exactly. So, yeah, with pro wrestling, yes, it's staged, but, I mean, nobody pretends that it's not anymore. We all just tell you, yes, it's a show. It's a stage, you know, and, you know, the canvas, the ring, that's our stage. That's how we tell stories. But uh, bringing it back to uh, WWE and what have you, it's the same. It works on every level pretty similarly. Uh, well, sorry, getting my words mixed up because it's early. But uh, it's a similar process from when you are uh, on the independent wrestling scene. So as like someone like me who's not yep. in the yet or AEW. Yeah. Uh, company um it's pretty similar to the process of the wwe the only difference is the money you know what i mean because of there's course. a lot more money involved with the wwe of course AEW, those bigger companies but essentially when you are in the wwe you're still an independent contractor um, okay sign a contract yep but it's a very loose contract i mean it's not guaranteed uh kind of like with the nfl national football league it's really yep. big in America. It's starting to grow yep. a little bit globally. Um, those football players, American football players, uh, their contracts are not guaranteed. And it's the same for WWE, where, you know, Brock Lesnar may be making, let's just say, $9 million base salary with no incentives, no uh, merchandise involved, just base salary. He's making $9 million, but that's not guaranteed. He's got to make all of those dates that he is contractually obligated to make. Gotcha. To okay. Make so he could he could, he could, could sort of not make that $9 million, uh, right. because he, he might fall ill or, 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 or he's got another commitment somewhere else, which is more important than, than possibly fighting. Uh, but yeah. – but, uh, you know that sort of clears the point. So, but then, but then these wrestlers are so um, they're like every kid's hero, right? right? Yeah. I mean, so, when you when you grow old, then it's like yeah, it's all uh, it's all just like you said, it's all fifty percent is fake, you know. But right. when you when you're young, you want that you know, pro macho man, sort of the muscles and everything. And, you know, the guy walking into the ring and, and you know, the, the, the sort of confidence. And I'm pretty sure, correct me if I'm wrong here, bro, that 
these WWE um, uh, audiences that come to see it, I'm pretty sure that most of them get dragged by their kids into this wrestling show. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, so I would say 90% of the families you see there, the mom and dad, or the mum and dad, as, as y'all would say in the UK, yeah, uh, they're casual fans. They may watch it because their child watches it. Yeah, yeah. Generally, yeah, that's what it is. Their, their child wants to go. And that's why you've seen the WWE transition away from you know, back in the back in the '90s, early 2000s, it was pretty violent, and you had a it was very sexualized and whatnot. Yep. Blood still involved. They've kind of pivoted away from that over the last, I would say, you know, 12 to 15 years, and it's more of a family-friendly product. And you know, I, I I'm kind of on the fence whether that's a good business model or not, because on one hand, that's how they've been driving traffic into their arenas. Uh, people paying money for the tickets. But on the other hand, on the flip side, from the television product, it's just not as enjoyable, especially for someone that's, you know, in that, like, four, age 14 to maybe 35 range, predominantly male, but there are females that watch it too. Yep, yep. Um, and so from an entertainment... Uh, I'm, I'm, sure the, I'm sure the females come there to see the, the, the sexy guys, the big guys, you know, just to... Yeah. Uh, that's what they're into, but yeah, for sure. Uh, I was <laughs> mentioned uh, how the the kids look up to these these pro wrestlers. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that you're you're kind of like around a real life superhero of sorts. You know, you yep. have the outfits. Yeah, not all wrestlers that are yep. on yep. Jack to the gills. Yeah, the are these days. So um, yeah, I would imagine that that's that's. Kind of I mean, the amount of times me and my brother used to just just wrestle, and then and then every time every time you see WWE uh, start up, right, and then it would be like, please do not try this at home. These right. wrestlers are trained to sort of fight like this, but we never gave a damn. Once I I, I picked him up and I I threw him into a show cabinet, glass. Right. And like literally, it was. Uh, mom and dad came home, and it was mayhem. <laughs> yeah. yeah good... But yeah, um, so to get get back to uh, what you were speaking of, of earlier, your question, you said that you know how did you go from having an entrepreneurial spirit to pro yep. wrestling? Yep. And I kind of loosely touched on it, but when you're a pro wrestler, you kind of are an entrepreneur because you are your own business. You know, a lot indeed. Of the... We're doing our own merchandise. Yeah, we're the ones making the calls to get our bookings. We're doing all of this, so you're you are essentially your own business. And I think that a lot of pro wrestlers on my level that are younger in the game haven't made it to the WWE or AEW yet, a company like that, or even New Japan over in Japan. Um, they kind of lose sight of the fact that you are a business. You know what I mean? Um, they kind of get they kind of get swept away by the uh, the aura of, like, oh, wow, I'm a pro wrestler. Yeah, yep. this crazy life. It is a crazy business. Pro wrestling is easy, easily the craziest business that I've ever been around. I was in the military for five years. I've wow. been around the world and done And this was, the military was before uh, the pro wrestling. Yeah. Right, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I did that for five years. Was that, a, was that a compulsory point that you wanted to, I mean, by the government, or you just out of choice? No, as out, out of choice, um, we're not obligated here in America to okay. join. Okay. Um, okay. But you know, I, I I had some military members in my family, so it was always something that was an option. I never really wanted to serve in the military, but the older I got, I you know I was working sixty five. So, so did I, you did you possibly go to Afghanistan and Iraq or no? no that was no, before no. that. The only th and I can't really speak too much on it because I had to. I actually had to sign a form before I got out saying that even oh. about certain things. But wow. what I can tell you is, uh, I I've been on missions with the B two bomber. Um, that's like our stealth bomber here in America. Okay. Okay. Do some stuff. Um, I've been to Guam. Uh, okay. Oh, but other than that, I can't really tell you too much. That's fine. Don't worry. We'll not. We'll not touch that. But then. 
okay, so you went to the army for five years and that obviously the training and everything that they give you is quite intense, right? And the army, it's, it's, yeah. it's, well, it's like, it's like gym, gym 10.0 kind of thing, you know, right. that's the sort of training they give you out there. Yeah. Well, I was in the air force, so it's, uh, it's an, it's an extension off of the army. Like, uh, the Marines are an extension off of the Navy here in America. Yep. 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 So when you deploy, you deploy with army. So I guess in some respects you could say, yeah, uh, army, but, um, yeah, the training, the training was pretty nuts. I, I, when I look back on it, I was actually having this conversation about a week ago with my, uh, uh, with one of my friends, um, who I had over to, to like, you know, grill and, uh, start a fire barbecue hang out. But, um, we were talking about the training and it's like when I was living it, I didn't realize how crazy the things that I was doing, I didn't realize how crazy they actually were. And now I've been out for five years and I look back and I'm like, wow, you know, like I did some crazy SHI, you finished the rest, you know, like it's crazy stuff that you only really see on like television or you, you read in books and whatnot. Possibly a movie or something like that. Right. And so I look at the training I did and then I think about the real badasses in like the United States military, like the Navy SEALs or the Marines. And I'm like, I can't even imagine the training that they went through because just the training that I went through was already pretty extensive. Right. Yeah. I mean, especially the Marines must be going through and I yeah. mean, that must be the topmost training oh, yeah. uh, sort of uh, because they're on the ground. Right. They yeah. are the ones who are going to pave the way for the seals and the air force you know so uh the true badasses in, in absolutely in our armed forces for sure um and then yeah with the navy seals like they're they're elite you know they're the elite of the elite um yep. but yeah, that training uh was definitely crazy but it's something that prepared me for whenever i got back out into the civilian world um you know, it gave me a lot of confidence is what it did. Um, and I realized, hey, if I can do, if I can jump out of freaking helicopters and I can do all this crazy stuff and I can handle these weapons that I would never be able to touch, like, in the... If you're a civilian. <laughs> then I could probably do anything. You know what I mean? Can I ask you a quick question here? Uh, because you mentioned that you came out with a lot of confidence of the army. Um but there are people out there um, in the UK and the US. I come from Pakistan myself, so um, I, I've seen I've seen how people are sort of disorientated after they leave the army. Um, a lot of uh, psycho uh, psychological effects, you know, all that kind of stuff that sort of plays with their mind. How did you battle that through? I mean because you said that you came out of out with confidence how how can someone let's say they're in the army and they've seen all this that's gone on how can they battle through that and come out with the confidence that they need to face the civilian world again well that's a very good question i think a lot of it has to do with um you know when you see people that deal with ptsd or something of, of that nature i think a lot of it is uh you, you have to recognize that you have to know that about yourself yeah make improvements on your current situation because a lot of people and i want to speak for everyone but a lot of people when they come away with something like that they will allow it to consume their life and then it's always a crutch like oh well i have this or i have that um and it really, it's it's all a mental thing. It's all in your ears, you know. Something, something that you could compare with in today's day and age that we are in. Do what? Sort of. Something that we can compare with in today's day and age that we are with, you know, with the fear that's around us and yeah. the situation that's around us. I mean, yeah. we'll come back to that at the later stage because I've been seeing your life stories and seeing your Instagram and everything. You know, I I really want to talk to someone about that. Um, right. so you were saying that people are, when, when, they, when they, when they come out of this army situation and they, they start thinking that, you know, uh, 
because of this, I now have this issue or because of that, I, I possibly saw something in the army and now I'm like that. I mean, so you were mentioning that how can they, how can they sort of put that away and, and bring out that confidence in them that no, they are better than that. So well, a lot of it is uh, routine self-improvement. You know, you constantly have to be working on yourself. You constantly have to identify what your issues are, but you cannot let it consume you. Um, and if it is, and if it's causing you problems, you need to get to the root of that problem. Uh, like for me, I had a drinking problem for years. Um, and I'll, I'll yeah, do you mention drinking, drinking problem? Do what? Sorry, what problem did you mention? So it got cut I off. Had a drinking problem, like I okay. drank. Okay. Okay. A lot of alcohol, a lot of beer. All right. Yep. Yep. So, you know, I drank. I drank beer before I joined the military, but it didn't really. It didn't really accelerate until I was in the military. You know, it became a huge problem, and I've been probably four or five months now not drinking beer. Um, I, I've had like one beer, I think, in the last five months now. Wow. And I had like half of it. I didn't even finish it. Uh, just Seriously. I, wow. Was, so you've come, a, you've, come a, you've come a long way. Right. Since, yeah. yeah. Right. But it's constant self-improvement, like I was just talking about. Constant self-improvement, knowing. And I will be honest with you, it took a major illness for me to realize, like, hey, you have an issue. Um, even though in the back of my mind, I had known for about, you know, probably six, seven years that I had an issue with drinking, you know, and it's affected relationships, friendships, um, my relationship with my parents at times, you know, it's affected my, uh, I would say, not so much my work ethic or my, my ambition, but definitely some of my natural innate drive that I had as a child and going, you know, into my later teenage years, um, it kind of neutered me in a way to where I was still doing a lot. I was still doing a lot and functioning on a pretty high level, even whenever I was an alcoholic, but I wasn't, I could do more. I knew I could do more, you know, and you I could do, you could do more than what you were, you were already doing, but right. that because of the alcoholism sort of that, put you back in terms of what you could achieve even further. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I know that I'm, and I live it every day now because I do so much more on almost a daily basis now. And I was, I was maybe doing half of what I'm doing now is maybe doing half of that just five, six months ago, you know, and that was my life for many years, almost a decade just yep. drink all the time, you know? Um, so, and I would uh, attribute some of that drinking to my time in the military, not just from like a party aspect or that it was part of the uh, culture, but just also the stress of the job, you know? Um, doing what I had to do, um, constantly switching schedules where, hey, you're working nights, so you're working 4 p.m. to... 7 a.m. and then having it switched and now you're doing you know 4 a.m. to freaking 7 p.m. and it's just wow a constant uh you know a constant struggle and uh just a lot of different challenges but but when I look back at it that was just an excuse you know as I was using that as an excuse to drink the way I was um so I think that that's important for people that do have PTSD or they have problems with alcoholism or their drug abusers or what have you. You don't even necessarily have to be in the military to experience these things. I'm sure. You yep. Know yep. 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 Um, yep. When people rely on those things that you got to be honest with yourself and you have to constantly improve yourself. And that could be a multitude of things that you have to do just to achieve that. You know, I'm always listening to motivational videos whenever I like do cardio in the morning or I work out. Yep. 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 Eating, um, I'm feeding my soul, so to speak, to where I'm being held accountable through <laughs> motivational videos or books or or even my loved ones, you know, and they don't yep. even know 
but I mean, this is why this is why I'm doing these live sessions, for example, you know, right. because uh, I mean, when when this whole lockdown thing started at the end of March, I mean, I was pretty low as well, negative because I'd lo- I'm into the property business and I'd lost a few deals because of this lockdown and it it had a financial effect on me. Um, but I thought, uh, I then, and then one week I was, I was just sitting at night doing my work. I said, okay, let's turn on this live session. Right. And someone just came up and, uh, and, uh, started talking. We started talking work. We started talking life. And all of a sudden I thought that, hold on a second. Why not start something unique out here? You know, right. and that's when I thought that, okay, let's, let's not talk just about myself. I want to talk with people. I want to know what people are up to right now, what people have done in their career. How can someone's uh, uh, life or career enlighten, empower someone, you know? And, and that's why I started doing these live sessions with people too. Like you said, food for soul, right? And that's what I'm doing right now. Yeah. No, it is a great concept. Uh, you know, I have a podcast, the Hooligan Hour podcast, and that's one of the things that I've done is, uh, you know, I I made it real gimmicky for about the first year to where I kind of just copied the model of uh, AM, FM radio. Um, okay. I'm not sure if radio works over in the UK. I'm a little ignorant to that, but uh, AM, FM radio. Yep, yep. I took some of that concept and applied it to the podcast world because I realized that a lot of the podcasts I was listening to all sounded the exact same. And then I kind of got to the point where I transitioned away from that a little bit to where I just enjoy the conversations now. You know, I I like best on possible, especially at a time like this, because, you know, it allows us to kind of communicate and absolutely other is doing and how people are coping with it. Um, So I think you got a great model. And I hope you have a lot of success with it. I think you I should. Podcast. Yes. I don't know. I, 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 I enjoyed this live session, you know, where, where we can talk and then people right. sort of come in and put their conversations and put their questions and all that kind of stuff. And also, even if there is no one here right now, this live story stays on my uh, share for the next 24 hours. Right. So yeah. people can come watch it, watch snippets of it, fast forward it the way they want, you know, and I think I'm still learning because it's just been like four, three, four weeks that I've started this. Right. Uh, but the more I conversate with people, the more I try to, I think I'm getting better at it, sort of. No, you're doing a pretty good job. I mean, to be honest with you, you said three or four weeks. I figured you've been doing this for like three or four years. No, not at all. And the fact is, people tell me, oh, what questions are you going to ask me? You know, and I'm like, I don't have a set of questions. I just go with the conversation. I, I, I want to portray you like my friend. So if I'm talking to my friend, questions will just come here. You know, we'll just talk. And that's, yeah. that's, how, that's how I tend to do it. Yeah. See, I, I usually uh, I usually prepare whenever I do my podcast, but that's usually because I do I'll do a little bit of like background, yep. brief, but not on my guests. And that way, yep. I kind yep. of piece the narrative the way that I kind of want it to go. Um, and that's just my method. But there's no there's no like de facto method. I'm um, sorry. Yeah. It's all right. But there's no de facto method to anything to, to, so to I, exactly so i'm like i like to i like to sort of we call it freestyle right we call it freestyle it's freestyle let's let's, yeah. let's carry on uh, yeah. so coming back to so we spoke about the army pro wrestling what made you i mean obviously you said that but at the age of four you were watching wrestling and all that kind of stuff but why wrestling you know, I really, I really don't know. I don't know what made me uh, super drawn to it as a four-year-old, but I would assume that it's for all the reasons that we mentioned earlier with, you know, it's almost like these are real life superheroes, you know, with their flashy outfits, especially back in that time, early. I mean, days. I've seen some of your flashy outfits, you know, the, the golden jacket and then the red jacket, you know, it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I appreciate that. But um, you go back to like the early 90s, and even back in the 80s, before I was, you know, around, um, 
everything was super flashy and you had like these guys were you know massive and yep. they were just real life superheroes so my uh the first wrestler that i was drawn to was macho man randy savage who you referenced earlier so yeah i think uh once i saw him and then my dad bought me like a little wrestle buddy like the little yeah, yeah 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 my first my first wrestle buddy was bret hart bret hart <laughs> Bret Hart and then I got the Undertaker so then I used to make them fight and stuff it was crazy crazy times when we were kids right it's 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 yeah. it's great yeah Undertaker's still going surprisingly he's like damn near 80. I mean he's 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 in there to make his money right he's he's yeah but he's also the Undertaker he's kind of a uh, if there's one walking legend living legend Undertaker 100% yeah. absolutely absolutely <laughs> do what he wants but yeah. yeah um he probably won't retire until they tell him like hey you, you <laughs> he probably won't retire until the day he dies <laughs> yeah. i'd be out there with the mask but but it's good to see him every wrestlemania you know just popping up and then and just uh but i i've not i've not followed i mean i hear it from my younger cousins oh you know we're watching wrestlemania today and undertaker is coming it's been it's been quite a few years since i actually sat down and i watched even 20 minutes of the wwe but anyways um so how long did you do your pro wrestling for well so i like i mentioned earlier i've been doing it for four almost five years and you're uh, still doing it what you're still doing it Oh yeah, I'm still doing it. Okay. I I've been injured for the last year. I'm I'm good now. Um I just haven't been cleared by a doctor yet, but okay. I took my labrum, a pectoral and my bicep a year ago. Um my last match was actually a year ago yesterday, May 4th, oh. 2019. Um so but I, I you know, I tore my labrum pec and And bicep. that was actually while you were fighting in the in the ring? No, uh Or no. No, I wish I had a cool story for it, but I actually got injured from a massage chair. <laughs> oh no, seriously. <laughs> I took massage chairs. Yeah, it up pretty good. I I purchased one and I it was like maybe the second time I used it, just I heard the snap and the pop and everything in my chest. Ooh. Sure enough, like uh about a month a month later I finally went to the doctor and they're like, "Yeah, you you tore your labrum." and part of your pectoral. So uh in July of 2019. So was that was that over that month that you didn't go and see the doctor? Did you think that there was something wrong? I mean, I mean Yeah. Yeah, I knew something was wrong because whenever I was working out, um I knew like I noticed that I didn't have as much strength on my left side uh whenever okay. I would do uh shoulder workouts, I would do flies, dumbbell flies. I I couldn't really do even a 15 pounds weight. very well um whenever i do back exercises like pull downs i i noticed that i just didn't have a whole lot of strength over here yeah um, so yeah i knew pretty pretty quick that i had torn it because i actually tore my right one whenever i was still in the military um wow. like 5 years ago so i've had both shoulders done now and yeah you know it is wow really cool. i mean yeah. this is this is like uh, the This is the sort of stuff that you used to hear on the the wrestling show, right? I mean, I never thought that I would actually speak to a wrestler and talk to him about live injury and all that kind of stuff, you know, but it's it's pretty cool. I wrestled two matches after I knew that I had uh torn my And that head. must have that must have worsened worsened it, right? Sure. But what was that? That what that must have worsened it more. I mean, the injury. Well, um You know, so I had taken about 3 or 4 months off because I had some little nicks and bruises from 2018. I wrestled really hard in 2018. I took a lot of bumps. I went through I went through tables and chairs and fell off ladders. I I did all of that and it was my first real experience doing all those crazy matches that year. Wow. Wow. Uh, uh of- jumping off a ladder onto the table, does that hurt? Oh yeah. Well, to be honest with you, the table actually kind of breaks your fall. Um, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt, you know? Like it, it's still yeah. it's, um the worst was the first table I ever went through. 
I went through the table and the left side of the table, it collapsed and I had my head cocked this way. Ooh. Side of my head. I had this massive knot right here. I mean, uh, I, I remember the, the first ladder match that I ever saw in my life. Razor Ramon was a Shawn Michaels. Shawn uh, Michaels, yeah. That was a long time ago. But that, that was a long, long time ago. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the better ladder matches of all time. It was actually the first one. Yeah, 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 for the Intercontinental match. I remember yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Um, So, yeah, I did a couple of those ladder matches that year. Um, So I, I had been banged up, and I wanted to take a couple months off. So I took some months off. I came back. I had one match. And then, then is when I'm pretty sure, like, I got injured. And at this point, I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know enough about it. And I'd just come back. I had some pretty big opportunities coming up later in 2019. So I didn't want anything to slow my, my momentum, but it just got progressively worse week by week to where I was losing strength. Um, I could tell that my muscle mass wasn't right. I could tell something was off. And then finally, I just had to be honest. To go with to the doctor and, and, and check it out. Did the, did the doctor advise you of not doing any exercises or any pushing weights or anything like that? Um, I had a complete tear, so it had to be repaired surgically. It wasn't going to heal on its own. Do it on its own. Yep, yep. On its own, but it's very, very rare. Um, but I had a complete tear, so I had surgery in July of 2019. Um, and then I spent about probably six six months, uh, six, seven months just sideline. I couldn't do anything. Uh, you know, I, I could have done some leg workouts, I guess, but. Um, so until like, until like early 2020, you were still sort of kind of right. just, you, you were away from the gym and all that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, I didn't start working out again until February of this year, 2020. Um, but I'm already starting to put like muscle back on, starting to get back to like normal and be myself yep. again. Um, it feels somewhat normal. I have some aches and pains every now and then. Um, it's usually like late at night or if I have yep, work. Yep. Um, but yeah, and, you know, it took me from July 2019 until February of 2020 before I could work out again. Um, I could do no cardio during that time um, because most cardio involves like, you know, you're, you're running or you're, you know, you're hiking or you're doing stuff. And my doctor just didn't want me to do any of that. Um, so I avoided it. I was a couch potato, unfortunately, for a while. Um, and it, it got me really depressed, to be honest with you. I, I was very depressed for a while um, because I felt like a caged animal. That's not me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, but you could go out and do stuff, right? You could go to a restaurant. You could go to cinemas. Oh, you could, yeah, I, that was, there was no... There was no restriction on that, but it was just exercise that you had restriction on. Right. Yeah. No, I, I still had a somewhat of a social life. You know, I, I have, you know, I have a woman who I'm about to get married to. So I, I Oh, still congratulations. Have... Is you, it this I... year? Yeah. Yeah. We're getting married in about Congratulations. Three... Thank you. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I still had a social life to a degree, but uh, during that period, I was, I was real depressed. I didn't really want to go and hang out with everybody all the time, especially like other wrestlers, um, because they were getting to do all the things that I couldn't do at the moment. They were getting opportunities that, you know, I wanted. And so there was a little bit of like envy there, I guess, which when I look back at it, what's the point of envy? You know, it's oh. envy, pointless. Um, Absolutely. About it, and you break it have down. You, have, you, have you shared the room with any mainstream wrestler? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I was trained by Booker T. You t you mentioned that, yes, Booker T. Here in Houston, uh, Texas, at Reality of Wrestling. I was there for a little over two years, like two years, three months, and then I, I left um, unceremoniously. Just we had some differences, and I wanted to kind of go off and do my own thing. Um, I think they've relaxed a lot on their policies and whatnot, so I'm, I'm actually planning to go back there um, okay. once I cleared and, and start training there again. But um, what I what I did is I just went off and trained at other places um, over the last two plus years. Um, it kind of just 
worked my own schedule. I wrestled where I wanted to wrestle. Yep, yep, yep. But yeah, I was I was trained by Booker T. So through him, I you know I got to be around like people like Kurt Angle. Um, my first match was the Boogeyman. Actually, I'm not sure if you're oh familiar. seriously, yes, I know, yes. Um, but yeah, Kurt Angle, Boogeyman, Rob Van Dam, uh, Diamond Dallas Page, DDP. Yep, 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 yep. Um, Booker's brother Stevie. I love. Yep, Stevie. Yep. Um, we get along great. Um, obviously, Booker's wife, Charmel, um, Ray Mysterio. Yep. Just so many. Uh, oh, John Bradshaw. Just a lot of different ones. And at other shows around the country, you know, I've gotten to be on shows with like Joey Ryan. He's he's he was never like a WWE uh, top level name, but. He's made a pretty good career for himself outside of the WWE. He's pretty well known, like globally, by wrestling fans. Um, but yeah, I've, I've gotten to be around quite a few um, people, you know, that I used to grow up watching on TV, or I had their freaking action figures. And, stuff. <laughs> and then you must have you must have gone in the room, and they're like, "Wow!" You know? yeah. yeah. Um, it's pretty interesting. No, you're good. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's definitely a unique experience once you So apart from wrestling, um being apart a fan. Uh, sorry, I was asking, apart from wrestling, what other entrepreneurial skills are you currently doing? What are you doing with your life and and how are you keeping up with business? Yeah, well, um, so I've been writing a graphic novel for a little while. I've got that in the works. Um, I've finished volume one. It's a three-volume series. I've finished volume one. We've got the script for that. Now we send it off to the artist. He's working on, like, character designs. Um, and it's funny because the, char the protagonist in those novels, I'm actually going to be returning to wrestling as that character. So I will no longer be my old cash money hooligan character with like the fur coats or anything that's that's dead that's gone okay uh, I, it'll be based off of this protagonist in the graphic novels but uh the graphic novels don't really have anything to do with wrestling to be honest okay with you. It's, uh, time yep. travel. there's some politics in there it's um uh, it it's very much like a comic book um in the traditional sense but it's based around time travel uh so I've been working on that. Um, I've still been doing my podcast. I'm actually going to be coming out with a second podcast next month. And that will be more like kind of what you're doing, where you're just talking to people, getting to know people from all around the world. This will be called Life with a Hooligan. And it'll be more of just, uh, you know, everyday talk. Everyday talk. Yeah. 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 Talking to wrestlers, uh, people with unique talents that aren't pro wrestlers or athletes. Because usually on the Hooligan Hour, my my primary podcast it's mainly i mainly interview wrestlers and athletes every now and then i'll interview like an entrepreneur or a bodybuilder or a chef you know but i want to transition those people over to the other podcast okay kind of separate a little bit yeah uh, and then i've been developing my production company which you know like i mentioned earlier it's kind of been on idle a little bit you know we're still moving in that direction but yeah I can't go out to the banks right now and get so the, the money. What will the what will the production company? I mean, you mentioned films, right? You're 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 getting into films. Yeah, so we're gonna do commercial advertising, short films to start out with, and original programming. So I have three original shows that we will be debuting under the guise of that production company. Um, and I'll just rattle off a few of them right now. Uh, one is called Stats and Snacks. That's going to be um, basically, it's going to be. Their football. It's always, it's always the case that when you're on a live session, people start calling you. Oh, yeah. No, it's, it's no big deal. Um, but anyway, we're doing a show called Stats and Snacks where. Um, I'll highlight like stories around the National Football League, our American Football League, um, stats, 
you, you name it, but we'll also have a chef on there who will be making a special dish, whether it be a snack or an actual dish for that, for your football parties on the weekend. Gotcha. Okay. Um, we'll be doing, and then we're also going to have a show called Tequila Tonight. I just got to <laughs> that process. Um, tequila Tonight, kind of like late night talk shows. Except, With the drink. Yeah, there will be tequila involved. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Kat, you've seen Hot Ones on YouTube. Have you seen that? No. Hot Ones? They, no. Okay. What it is, it's like an interview. Um, this guy interviews, like, all these famous celebrities and athletes and musicians around the world, and they try different hot wings with different levels of heat. Gotcha. And to the point where they're just, like, almost vomiting. It's crazy. Um, wow. So, I take a little bit of that concept, but applying, you know, the tequila to it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so no are, you, are you are you are you are you are you trying to say that these tequilas will have variations of alcohol in them? Yes, they will. Wow. They, they will. I'm not going to try to make anyone puke or anything like that. But you know, we'll start off light and then we'll we'll gradually go up. Um, that is kind of the concept. Plus, I just think it you know it's uh, it'll be fun. Yes, to be able to relax. You know, hey, have a drink, just chill. Um, and that'll probably be one of the rare times that i that i do drink is on that show unfortunately i'm gonna have to do it because you, know, <laughs> you, you got you gotta practice what you preach yeah if I'm the host, <laughs> that's uh that's how we're gonna be able to really like market the production company out to these small business and corporations here in america and eventually i'd like to take it global but for the you know first five years it'll be uh texas and the united states We'll be marketing towards like small businesses and corporations. We'll do commercial advertising for them. Um, I'm going to offer studio space to where if they want to come in and have their own original program so they can have more communications okay. with their audience. Their I can't hear you. Hello, Brock, I can't hear you. No, nope. you can't hear me either. Let's, let's, let me come back. I'm going to end this and I'll come back.